Hello, my name is Alex Ars, and in today's episode, we're going to be talking about Breton DNA. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking about the genetic population of Brittany, which is by Eleves et al. in 2003. Now this was actually a request by Bjorn uh, Smith 9431 in the comment section. So I do actually read your comments, I try and respond, and if you have a request or something that you're really interested about, please do say it because I'll often look into it, especially if it's a topic I'm interested in. Now the funny thing is, is that when I was going through the comments, I was just, oh no, I'm going to become the DNA guy, and I don't want to become the DNA guy. Um, it's an interesting one for me. I, I'm, I find the whole idea of DNA and stuff like that fascinating, population change, stuff like that. And you can see I've got a whole, you know, a series on the channel where I've gone into different bits and bobs. Um, and I try and look at it about population change and large scale stuff rather than, uh, you know, specific signatures in the DNA and stuff like that. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and synthesize the paper for you and try and just bring it to life. Now, the first thing I want to say about this paper is, and you'll find it down in the description if you would like to read it yourself, but it's a modern DNA study. And one of the things I found was it was quite hard to read. Most of these papers can be quite scientific, but I think that there was some stuff that might have been lost in translation. That's not a criticism of the academic work. The academic work was really good, but you could just tell some of the English was a tiny bit clunky at points, which made it a little bit harder to understand. Um, one of the things about as well is also the scale of it. They're trying to use modern DNA, and it's a modern DNA study, so they're taking people who are alive today, their DNA, and then they're using that to work backwards to find out about ancient populations. This has its positives and its negatives, but the problem is, is that over human history, human DNA mutates. And when it mutates, there are slight changes throughout human history that basically means that we are different to our ancestors. There have been population mixing and stuff like that. That basically means that we are not the same people who lived in the medieval period, the early medieval period, the Iron Age. You know, that's fine. That's how human history works. We mix together, we become new peoples, new cultures. That's how it happens. So I'm always wary when you start off with a modern DNA study that's then working backwards. But with this as well, it's a very interesting one because it's trying to understand how the genetic populations of Brittany work. So they took 3,234 modern day people, of which 856 were suitable for the study because what they did is they said your grandparents have had to live within 30 kilometers of each other. So they looked at that and that's, that's normally quite common that they take people's grandparents and they say, right, these people are going to be the sample for this study because of the fact that they haven't moved too much. And if your grandparents haven't moved, then maybe you haven't been a part of lots of widespread movements in human history. The problem is in the last 300 years, we've seen a lot of movement, especially of stuff like the railways, um, airplanes, uh, international shipping lines. You know, you, you do see human movement. So that's, it's not always the best plan to say, well, if your grandparents have lived in the same place within 30 kilometers of each other, you're suitable for the study. Um, I believe there was one study that which was in Britain which said that yeah, it was oh, Leslie et al. 2015, if I'm correct, uh, if I've remembered it properly. Uh, if I haven't, please forgive me, I've got a lot in here. But uh, Leslie said if your grandparents lived in the same place as their grandparents and were within, I think it was 50 kilometres of each other, then you were suitable for the, wide scale, the full scale genetic study of the British Isles, which was a really good paper but for modern DNA. Anyway, coming back to the Breton, uh, 624 Breton genotypes were identified and then they were used as a data set for this um, and compared to ADNA from across Europe. So using modern genetics, they then compare it to the ADNA samples and that's how they get their, their study of Brit Brittany. Now, the big problem with this paper for me was that they used a lot of ethnic toponyms to describe the different DNA, and they also used the term Viking. They're just like, oh, we compared it to Viking DNA, and I'm just like, ah, not their fault. It's just that there was a study that was all about Viking DNA, and they used that study. It's not great because of the fact that, you know, you go on the internet, you type in Viking, and you're going to find an article that says Viking was a job 
not an ethnic group. <laughs> so immediately to, to say that DNA is Viking is, is problematic. And also, how do you tell apart DNA that was like a Norwegian, let's say, who left Norway in the 1200s when there was like um, a climate shift and basically loads of people left because it was so terrible they were starving to death. Or a Norwegian who left in the 1700s, although let's say for instance Sweden. Sweden in the 17 and 1800s had a real boost forward in metalworking. They were really good at steel. So there are lots of Swedish people ended up around Europe basically helping to kickstart the steel industry in other countries, you see, in Britain and other places like that. So, you know, how do you tell apart a Swede who is from that period turning up in a genetic history of a modern day population? It's, that's one of the reasons why I find when people go, yes, I have Viking DNA, I'm just like, yeah, do you? Are you sure? Are you sure that, you know, you, your great-great-grandfather just didn't happen to be, you know, a Norwegian who decided to move to the United States? Anyway, that's going to upset a lot of people in the comments, and let's get back to the Breton. But um, the, the study then continues. And so when they continue, they divide Brittany into three main areas. The north of the Loire, the south of the Loire, and then they have the western part. And what they actually found was that inside those areas, the genetic groups actually fit very closely with um, the accents of the region. So different accents and different, um, what's it called, um, dialects of Brittany map very well onto the genetic groups. And they also found that um, surnames also mapped onto that as well. So surnames, accents, um, dialects and DNA was all very close and actually the biggest thing that stopped genetic flow was rivers and so if we come down to it what genetic flow means is basically two people having a baby so rivers are actually a big factor in stopping genetic flow so people aren't crossing bodies of water and that's what's really interesting is like it's just so human isn't it the people over there who live on the other side of the river they're funny they're different they speak it all differently you're going to marry someone in the next village or do you know what you know this is that's just the way it works and so they they cover that and they cover the sort of like the history is written is the next section in the paper so on page four and five they really go into the history of Brittany as we understand it and when they go into that, they just sort of explain it um, and really sort of dial down into the, the history as it's established, their version of the sort of ecclesiastical history, if you like. Moving on next, it then goes into a wider view of the genetic history of France. And they divide history, uh, the France into different regions. So it divides northeast, southwest and central. So the north and the east of France are generally seen as being closer to the UK, Ireland, Cornwall and Wales, but with a caveat that the east coast of Britain has a closer genetic history with Germany. Again, possibly reflecting the migration period and the move over into uh, the British Isles. Following on from that as well, the south and the west of France are closer to Spain. They share more of a genetic history with Spain. The central region has more her genetic heritage with Germany, Denmark and Belgium. Again, reflecting possibly a migration of peoples in the migration period and also the fact that those areas are just generally closer to Belgium and Germany. So you'd get people moving backwards and forwards across borders and stuff like that. Now, when it starts getting problematic is they say that Brittany has 23% of its DNA from Ireland and the rest of France has 14% of it. Now, this is a bit complex because this is where I'm coming back to ethnic toponyms. What I mean by that is you basically take a name of a modern day people or culture and you put it onto a DNA. Now, what's likely here is that the genetic groups who are reflected in this shared a similar ancestor. So it's not that there was a migration from Ireland into Brittany at some point, though there could have been that needs to be reflected in studies where they're taking re human remains from the early medieval period or before and they're comparing them to um, uh, ancient DNA from Ireland. And therefore you can say yes or no to a migration from Ireland. You can't really say by taking modern DNA and then comparing it to ancient DNA and going, oh well, Brittany got 23% of its DNA from Ireland. 
What's more likely is that both Ireland and Brittany share a similar genetic ancestor or genetic group that was their ancestor. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Because later on they say that half of all Bretons share 75% of their DNA with Ireland. And alongside that as well, 9% of all Bretons share their DNA with Cornwall, which is only reflected as 3 to 4% in other French groups. Now, the problem is, is what they're actually seeing is Bronze Age DNA. And what they're seeing is this Bronze Age migration, probably around about between, uh, you know, 5,000 to 3,000 BC from, you know, roughly the, um, the Pontic Steppe, which is parts of Russia, parts of Ukraine today, moving across into um, Central and Western Europe. And those populations would later on become the, uh, the populations that we recognize as Celtic, or like Iron Age France, Iron Age Britain, Iron Age Ireland, Iron Age um, parts of Northern Spain, uh, Iron Age Germany. And those groups mixed with either surviving groups or replaced surviving groups wherever they went. So for instance, in the British Isles, we see a near total population replacement between the Bronze Age population and the previous Neolithic population. In France, you do see some mixing, but in Northern uh, Brittany, Brittany north of the Loire, you actually see that there is a replacement. The, the, their DNA is mostly from that Bronze Age migration. So uh, south of the Loire, though, you see more, more survival of Neolithic DNA. So the problem is, is by saying that they are, you know, half of all Bretons share 75 of their DNA with Ireland, it's not that the Irish have migrated in, it's just that both of them have a similar ancestor. And this is where you can get problems because the way it's phrased, it almost seems like, you know, there's Irish or Cornish migration into Brittany. And there may have been. In fact, you know, many people say Brittany gets its name because of the fact that the British came out of Britain and went into Brittany at the end of the Roman period, you know, the 5th century is going on. But it previously had been called Amorica. Um, and so there's, there's that, that possibility there. But when you're using modern day names, it suddenly becomes that sort of like ethnic nationalism coming through. And I feel that this paper in the wrong hands could easily be misinterpreted. And you get that sort of pan-Celticism, national, ethno-nationalism going, we are the United Celts and we're all related. When actually what you're seeing is that, that there's a continuation, yes, but there's also mixing and change and it needs to be handled really well because you're seeing very interesting things in this where rivers are actually more of a boundary to population movement in many ways than other things. Um, and I find that more interesting uh, in many ways. So I think maybe if they'd used more established names within genetics, that would have helped rather than using modern day names because that then causes problems and it, it, it becomes more difficult, more murky, more mixed, and it can cause like, an, an us and them sort of thing, rather than understanding human history is a lot more complex than that. I would say that this is a good start to the paper. They do talk about six samples of early medieval DNA. Um, six is woefully little. If you've watched my other videos on Anglo-Saxon DNA or stuff like that, I talk about Schiffels et al, who does uh, in 2016 a paper. They use 10 samples. And I, I critique that harshly. I really don't, uh, I don't value that paper. They use six for Brittany, and I think that's a problem. One of them is found to be closely related to North African samples, but the way they say about that is they say, well, it was found within a settlement which was known to be a Roman town, but they don't say where. Now, I, I think that that is very interesting because it shows that the people from North Africa were moving to Brittany and back again. Um, and, you know, maybe those areas were far more connected than people actually realize because you have to understand that there was a very strong Christian community in North Africa and there was a strong Christian community in Brittany and stuff like that. And people may have been moving for religious purposes or trade as well, because if you think North Africa, there's a motorway basically or a, a big trade route going from the, um, the Eastern Mediterranean through the Straits of Gibraltar, which was called the Pillars of Hercules, up through the Irish Sea via Brittany. Um, to the north of Scotland. So the idea that a 5th, 6th century individual would have had North African DNA in, uh, in Brittany, for me, is not a surprise. Um, but it was just one of their sample. And if they want to do an ancient DNA study, they need to have two, three hundred to really 
get to grips with what's going on, and that's still small. So I hope I haven't been too critical, but I'm trying to bring apart this study, which is a little bit of a complex one. And I think it's important to really understand that when we're looking at DNA, these are very contentious issues and you want to really bring it out in a good way that helps people to learn and doesn't help build walls, uh, which some genetic papers can. So I really hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Uh, it's not too much of a downer. If you haven't already done so, please do subscribe. Share the video with your friends. If you'd also like to support me further, I do also have a Patreon and a coffee account down in the description. And that just means I can focus more time on creating these videos and sharing more history with you. Overall, thank you for watching today and I hope you join me for another video in the near future. Until then, though, stay safe and well and thank you very much.